Hey everybody, it's Mark from Modern Pain Care. I just want to thank you guys for joining me on a, at least Sunday afternoon my way. I don't know where you guys are all coming from. I know we have a lot of folks coming from across the globe. So if you get a second, why don't you just let me know uh, in the comments below here where you're coming from. Um, I know we got a lot of folks in the States that have uh, voiced interest and others. But uh, other thing I just wanted to apologize for, I have just uh, returned from golfing for about five hours where I was golfing in 100 degree heat and humidity and I am now cramping. So... I have electrolytes and am drinking them. Just hopefully I won't be squirming too much during my talk today. But I think this is just a timely topic. Pain physiology. How many of you guys, and maybe you can comment below me, if you've really felt like, man, I didn't really get a lot of pain education or pain physiology education in my training, or maybe I just don't even remember it. It felt like it was eons ago. And, you know, I remember something about a gait theory and pain and, other than that, it was just something where we don't really remember stuff. I think sometimes, at least for speaking for myself in physiotherapy school, it was all about, oh, I wanted to learn these new sports exercises and be a sports PT, or may maybe I wanted to be, I needed to learn these new manual therapy, manipulative and mobilization techniques. Um, and I really didn't really think as much about pain. It just, at that time, it didn't seem like it was, I mean, I don't want to say I didn't think about it, but it was always about something that I was going to fix with an exercise or a manual therapy technique. It wasn't necessarily uh, about understanding a lot more of the complexity of it. And we didn't get too much into the complexity of it in school. I got into the gate theory and I think that was about as, as deep as I went into it. So um, again, I just want to thank you all for joining me tonight. And what we're going to talk about today is the peripheral contributions to the pain experience. And I say, I didn't say peripheral nervous system contributions because I want to talk about the periphery in general. And one thing we'll start off with today is understanding that Categorical thinking is one of the weaknesses. It's it's something we use as learners to kind of compartmentalize information and maybe try to better understand it where we, um, you know, if you look into pain, gosh, there's so much. There's neurologists, uh, physiologists, uh, Im immunologists, endocrinologists, physical therapists, surgeons, you know, and we all have our little kind of category and knowledge base that we kind of come from and we how we understand pain and our biomedical colleagues very much reared into the biomedical tissue equals pain model of, of things. But when we really compartmentalize our knowledge into these kind of professions, we really limit our understanding. And if anything we've learned in the last 35 plus years as our understanding of pain has grown is, man, if we don't start reading outside of our professions and starting to become psycho, neuro, immuno, endocrine, physio, you know, whatever, ologists, uh, as far as knowing that kind of comprehensive knowledge base, we're going to kind of limit ourselves. And most importantly, we're going to limit our patients and better understanding their conditions and uh, definitely understanding it more from, you know, the mind-body uh, connection. You know, I think we have physiology that can really explain that connection. And we'll go into some of that tonight as we talk about some of these peripheral contributions. Um, so these body systems are often learned separately when we're in PT school or we're in medical school or different, uh, you know, training backgrounds. We, we learn about the immune system. Then we have another unit where maybe we learn about the endocrine system. And then we learn about the nervous system. And we learn about all these systems separately. But the, the, the body doesn't function with these at all on a separate island. And what we'll talk about tonight is how these systems are really one big homeostatic super system and when we look at the nervous system the endocrine system the immune system we could probably bring in other systems the motor system that's going to respond and elicit protective behaviors in an organism uh you know the, the psychology of a person you know the cognitions and all the things that go on in a person's brain that will influence these uh, systems so we have to understand that man this is complex this is this graph up here comes from an amazing article by Chapman and colleagues in 2008. It's a really heady read, and it's one you could probably spend a career and a PhD on. Um, and you kind of look at some of the professions that are blossoming out there right now. You see psychoneuroimmunologists coming out, and I'm sure we'll see more. But I think that's a representation of, man, we can't just keep our knowledge cordoned off. But this homeostatic super system uh, is basically there for our survival and our reproduction, if we look at it from an evolutionary perspective, as far as humans are always learning and trying to mount defense uh, reactions and maintain homeostatic uh, situations and respond to threats so we can survive, so we can pass our genes on to another generation um, and kind of uh, progress. But 
you know, we have the autonomic nervous system, which we'll talk about how it can kind of influence the, the nervous system, the immune system. Uh, we'll talk about how our endocrine system through systemic circulation and also our autonomic system can influence um, some things from a tissue and periphery based level. And all these chemicals here in the middle, uh, you know, they can become similar chemicals, but depending on what organs secreting them and where they are located in the super system, they might be called a neurotransmitter in one situation and a hormone in another. Um, it's a lot of complexity and stuff that I'm not going to get into the deep weeds of tonight, but hopefully get into some of it that'll give you some understandings of, man, this stuff's complex and man, it might make sense that we got to start thinking of cognitions and, uh, you know, system stresses and stress system reactions with patients when we think about their tissues and when we're evaluating their tissues. It's not just what that tissue feels when you poke on it, when you massage it, when you do anything that is targeted at a tissue. That's being modulated by this picture in front of you. And that picture in front of you is being modulated by a lot of complex stuff, including thoughts, beliefs, past experiences, all kinds of different things. So we again, we'll talk a bit about this and like we could get a PhD in this and spend a career and there are people doing that studying this type of diagram but let's back it up and look at the nervous system and we'll look at peripheral afferent fiber classification i'm not going to get too much into the motor system we'll talk maybe a little bit about that as in future lectures but um, these axon classes can get divided up into group one through four and then group one a and b depending on their specialized ending um, being the muscle spindle and the gold, uh, Golgi tendon organ. Um, we have the A-beta fibers, which are kind of our faster, highly myelinated, faster conducting, you know, proprioceptors, proprioceptors in the skin joint and muscle um, responding to a lot of different things. They're, all, they're really sending a lot of information into that central nervous system of body position and really giving us uh, an awareness of our body in space and the space that surrounds our body. Uh, A-delta fibers and C fibers, more thought to be Primary, the nociceptive fibers, uh, we're starting to understand. And if any of you read uh, Explained Pain or Explained Pain Supercharged, you'll understand that even some of the A-beta fibers have nociceptive functions. So a lot of this neat categorical categorizing of stuff, um, we're recognizing that some of that isn't exactly perfectly correct. But nonetheless, it's a helpful classification to help us understand that, you know, this A-delta fibers and the C fibers are our primary noxious stimuli or danger stimuli detectors, but we have to understand that our, they are not pain detectors. There's no such thing as pain out in the periphery. There is noxious input that needs to travel into our nervous system and do a lot of scrutinizing and modulating and determining from a central nervous perspective, how dangerous is this? Do I need to respond and produce a pain experience to have the organism do something that's beneficial to their survival? Uh, so I mean, again, it's quite complex. The other thing that nociceptors have are what we call sleeping or silent nociceptors and really a, a third of all nociceptors are silent so they're mechanically insensitive as far as they can take a lot of mechanical input at a quite high level and they don't really respond much at all but when you take these mechanically insensitive c fibers which are the same thing as what we talked about here the sleeping or silent nociceptors and a chemical reaction such as inflammation is nearby them and why do they wake up? And if a lot of these studies that Kathleen Sluka summarizes beautifully in her book and McMahon et al. Uh, in the textbook of pain, which is a massive read, but a great uh, textbook to have in your repertoire if you really want to nerd out on this in pain. But this chemosensitivity helps sensitize those when an inflammatory response is present. So it helps us sensitize tissues when there's inflammation present. So it's probably helpful, you know, part of that as far as when inflammation, we don't want things to be too mechanically sensitive when life is good, but when there's inflammation present, we probably want some sensitization of these nociceptive uh, uh, noxious input detectors um, <clears throat> when that inflammation is present so we can get more sensitive, we don't move as much, we take care of that body part. Now, of course, that gets to be a little bit maladaptive when you know the, the threat or noxious input is no longer present yet this sensitivity can remain present. And we'll talk about that definitely as we get into more spinal cord and central nervous system contributions to the pain experience as well in future lectures. Another thing that was really kind of interesting to me was this thought in when I was trained in physio school, it was kind of one of these things that um, I was always thought that afferent nerves fired one way. There was messages only going one way into the central nervous system and efferent fibers only had um, some communication out to the tissues. 
So when it, when it, when I read Gifford's book, and this is this diagram kind of is an adaption of Gifford's book, it talks about how not only do these nociceptors, you know, take in communication versus versus from the tissues through, you know, looking for different chemical things or, or pathological things that might represent tissue damage where it's going to communicate that information into the CNS. And then the CNS, as we can see in the middle there, it's going to modulate depending on the CNS's decisions on safe, dangerous. Is this something I need to pay more attention to or, or shift into the background? Maybe there's other more pressing stressors in my environment that doesn't really make that input something I need to, to be attentive to. But the, also that communication via these tish, these nociceptors into the tissue in an antidromic impulse flow that really kind of secretes chemicals into these tissues that kind of keeps a, I always, it's kind of like a, a balancer. I, I compare it to like the, the pool chemical guy who's always trying to, you know, keep the chemical balance of your pool neutral and, and make sure it's safe to swim. Well, nociceptors kind of have this trophic function where it's secreting chemicals into tissues to maintain balances and homeostatic balances of chemicals to keep tissues at an ideal sensitivity level, depending on what the organism uh, says here. I'm looking at the comments here. It looks like we got some folks from the UP. Hey, Michelle. Uh, Heather from Houston. Dre from Miami. Gary from New Jersey. And we got somebody from Flagstaff. That's about an hour up the hill, hour and a half up the hill for me. Great to have you guys here tonight. Um, but the, the one thing with this diagram, especially, is when we get issues where nerves get injured. So say one of these nerves gets injured and it disrupts this this situation where we get all kinds of this backfiring into tissue such as in CRPS or complex regional pain syndrome where you have these nerve fibers that get injured and they are sending in crazy amounts of input into tissues it's dysregulated and you get this red shiny swollen angry looking appendage that makes no sense um, when we think of a traditional tissue injury healing model but when we start talking about neuropathic pain situations or when nerves get injured, this situation can get crazy um, and go out of, out of control. This is a diagram that comes from uh, Kathleen Saluka's book, in, and it's a great book, uh, Mechanisms of Pain for the Physical Therapist. I'd highly recommend it. It's through the International Association for the Study of Pain. Uh, you can get it through their ebook store, but it's a great book that really kind of brings it down to more of a physiotherapist level. But if you're a chiropractor, a massage therapist, or somebody else. It might have some heady science stuff, but I still think there's some good tidbits in there that we can all learn from. But really here, these nociceptors and tissues, there's there's immune chemicals and different and cells into these tissues that are kind of present in tissues that are going to be um, activated. And, you know, mast cells, for instance, they can degranulate and truck histamine and prostaglandins into the tissue. You have uh, activated macrophages and tissues that can be activated and secrete these cytokines that are interleukins and uh, tumor nec tumor necrosis factor. I'm not going to get into the nerdery of exactly what these chemicals are, but um, tissue damage can also rely release uh, hydrogen ions and make the tissue more acidic. So we get acid sensing ion channels that can get activated. Heat can get produced where we get some heat sensing ion channels. Um, immune cells can do enkephalins and endorphins. There's serotonins that can get released released from platelets during injury. Also an injury, we'll show you the axonal reflex that stimulates plasma extravation, extravasation and vasodilation. I always butcher those words. Um, where we get openings of these capillaries where these immune system chemicals that are floating in our bloodstream, but also our endocrine system chemicals such as cortisol and other things that are secreted from brain types regions that can get trucked into the uh, nervous system and can relate some of the sensitivity to some of these nociceptive uh, fibers. So inflammation can do a lot of different things and this can be stimulated from tissue damage it can be stimulated by thermal noxious um, or mechanical input that can cause some of these cells to go uh, into some of the situations we talked about and release some of these different things i'm not i didn't label all the ion channels because that gets way above and beyond what we need to go know here but it's just to know that not only do locally do these cells get um are present in tissues but especially when we talk about things coming in from the plasma and our blood flow that's where systemically when we get high bounces, when we have stress responses that are trucking high levels of cortisol, or maybe if the stress response has gotten tapped out and there's hypocortisolism and cortisol is a potent anti-inflammatory. And when the cortisol system gets dysfunctional and there's great articles we'll talk about here in a little bit, when, when that stress system gets tapped out and there's not a lot of cortisol going on, it's, it's like the fire department is not staffed enough for the fires that are growing in the body. 
And sometimes that's thought to be a big contributor to those folks who have widespread pain syndromes and that type of thing where peripheral sensitization of tissues can be related to a lot of the imbalanced, you know, endocrine and immune system stuff that goes on, pro-inflammatory stuff that can go on with some of these system-based issues. We will talk about some of the system-based issues that can happen with immune systems and endocrine systems and different things and try to put a lecture here as we get through this these lecture series to kind of put it all together because I'm going to give it to you in a little bit of piecemeal and then hopefully we can kind of put it all together to show, okay, that makes sense for that fibromyalgia patient or, hey, now I can understand what's going on with this complex regional pain syndrome patient or, hey, this chronic fatigue thing starts to make sense when we put it all together where now the tissues in this nervous, central nervous system and these immune system, endocrine systems can all get kind of put together and understood, at least to the best of our ability. And that's still a work in progress from some pretty high level PhD level scientists. So peripheral sensitization is one of those things that's a normal thing that we should have happen around tissue injuries. And it's defined as the increased responsiveness and reduced thresholds of nociceptors to stimulation in the receptive field. So every nociceptor has a patch of skin that it's 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 in a patch of the anatomy underneath that skin that it's it's responsible for having sensory connections into. Um, after peripheral inflammation, those silent nociceptors begin to respond to that innocuous and noxious input. So again, that's where um, when that chemical situation chemically sensitizes and wakes up some of these silent nociceptors, all of a sudden now not just noxious input can cause things to get sensitive or just uncomfortable or, or emerge a pain experience. Now innocuous things such as movement, light touch. But that's something that we all experience if you've sprained or strained anything. There's a period there where, gosh, to move it or touch it, it's pretty dang sensitive. And that's that, and locally around the injury. And that's uh, the process we call primary hyperalgesia. And that's where, um, you know, the peripheral sensitivity around that noceptive, uh, receptive field of that nociceptive region can get sensitized and can help the organism, you know, emerge a pain experience around a body part that's helpful because it helps you don't monkey with it, let it heal, let the body's inflammatory healing process do its thing for us. No, secondary hyperalgesia is when the sensitivity spreads outside the region of the injury or outside the region of that no receptive field of that nociceptor. And then the thought there is it's, it's this is starting to be central sensitivity into kind of areas around the dorsal horn and other areas. We're going to not talk about that in depth tonight because we'll, we'll have another lecture here where we talk about the spinal cord and brain. But um, the central nervous systems are a comp a summation of many nociceptive fibers that are summating onto one central uh, nervous system, secondary nociceptive neurons. So um, there's a lot of surface area that these central neurons can have that can cause some of these things, especially when sensitive reactions are going on in some of these areas, it can cause some of the spreading pain to happen. And we'll talk about more of how pain can spread in different things when we get into the neuroimmune interface and talk about how disinhibition and inhibition can happen where all of a sudden these areas that were normally nice and blocked out where you could only feel pain in you know kind of a very specific region all of a sudden it's spreading into other levels and areas of the body um, and we can start explaining that due to some uh, interesting neural immune issues that go on in the body in pain the axonal reflex is something that can also make sense of this peripheral sensitization issue where when we first think about it, again, I kind of thought about this as a very linear process where there's a receptor stimulus of this noxious mechanical thermal um, or uh, chemical stimulus that can trigger a action potential in a uh, nociceptor and it travels into the central nervous system, the spinal cord and says, hey, danger. But what happens is that if you think about these nerve fibers, they have a kind of a dendritic branching of, um, you know, nerve fiber that can also stimulate other parts where it can stimulate that arterial where we get that uh, extra visation of, of chemicals coming out of arterioles. It also can stimulate some of the interconnectedness of keratinocytes and different things that are involved in skin repair. It can also stimulate mast cells where we get degranulation and uh, prostaglandins and histamines getting pumped out into the body. And we all know those can influence pain as well. And then sp smooth muscles such as, you know, different, you know, sweating and trophic issues. Um, that can happen around the tissues as well, can get affected by that. So that's what can happen where you get the flare, the redness, and all these different things as uh, different things are degranulating, histamines trucking into the area, and there's significant blood flow and uh, extravasation of 
fluid into that area when you have some of that stimulus and danger messages coming into a nociceptor. So the dorsal re reflex is an interesting reflex as well, and I take this, and Kathleen Saluka wrote her article about this in 1995, and I can give you guys the reference list of this as well. I don't want to bore you with the reference list. And there is, by the way, a handout of this uh, in the comments of the live stream. If you don't, if it's not there, I will put it there, but I, sh I believe I put it there correctly before the stream started so you guys can follow along if you'd like to. Probably should have told you that on the front end. Um, Dorsal root reflexors have contributed to peripheral inflammation through the generation of action, action potentials and sensory fibers from the dorsal horn antidromically. So this is an example where like in a gastrointestinal issue where there's visceral input into the dorsal horn can kind of activate these things and it kind of sends a ripple effect not only into the central nervous system where messages can travel in and to the brain ideally or maybe into a spinal cord reflex or spinal neurotag, or it can bounce back out and flow back into the tissues um, of the skin. And that's a lot of what might be thought to be where there's referred pain when you have gut issues or a kidney issue that's giving you a flank pain because there's some dorsal root reflexes and different things going on, uh, along with a few other uh, you know, other neurologic and neurophysiologic processes that can cause uh, you know, rebound and reflex into the tissues. And again, cause some of the secretion of these neuropeptides and sensitizing agents and mast cell degranulations, all those things that we talked about that can cause an inflammatory response um, or sensitization into the tissues from that. The immune system in the periphery, again, it's important to know that there are immune system, there's kind of our innate uh, you know, immune system and, and uh, acquired immunity that happens as we acquire responses from exposure to different uh, chemicals and pathological issues. But um, I'm, I apologize if you hear my daughter crying. She has pink eye and she's not doing too well. So if you hear her crying in the background, I apologize for this. But uh, to go back to the immune system, mast cells reside, reside in peripheral tissues and they contain a range of inflammatory mediators. Uh, one of the big ones called are cytokines, which I talked about below. Um, they're released during cleavage or degranulation, which can be due to mechanical in, you know, cleavage of the cell or degranulation from some of the pathogens and chemicals that can be released into tissues when we have an injury. Activated macrophages reside in tissues and can be recruited from the blood as well, so they can release the same cytokines. Um, macrophages are those kind of Pac-Man type cells that can kind of gobble up some of these uh, pathogens and help clear some of these bacteria or, or foreign bodies or different things that can enter our tissues through injury. Neutrophils, early cell infiltrate the tissues from the blood and dominate acute and early inflammatory processes. I'm not going to make you guys know exactly what these are, but I just want to give you a little taste of some of the complexity of the neuro immune system in the periphery. And then cytokines are the common chemical messenger in the tissues. So we talk about chemokines, interferons, interleukins, lymphokines, and tumor necrosis factor. You can see if we go back a few slides, that those were kind of different things that were contained in some of those cells around the tissues. But that's kind of how our immune system, one of its chemical messengers that can kind of raise sensitivity into our tissues um, through these cytokines are this kind of common chemical language. And if we think about this neuroimmune endocrine system as one big electrochemical communication system to kind of, you know, bring homeostasis to the organism, but also to mount allostatic responses or responses to bring the organism back to homeostasis when it's been threatened, um, both uh, actually by tissue damage, but also we have to remember by potential tissue damage. And that can be by fear or concern or uh, you know, we have, there's many uh, interesting uh, studies there. One of the studies I recently read, I don't have it cited here, was just when uh, subjects were required to recount issues of bullying in their past, it, it set off pro-inflammatory reactions in their uh, tissues that were measurable and physiologically measurable. So again, the, the experience of that human being that sits in front of you when you ask them about their pain can influence how sensitive their tissues are and that's why you need to ask more than just you know a pain number and what movements hurt and don't hurt you gotta you know again we have to be careful and frame the right questions to the right patient but the immune system is going to hold a lot of different memories and um, different things and the the interesting thing that explained pain supercharge really brought out to me was this thought of toll-like receptors and these are proteins that are ion channels that are in sentinel cells kind of that in, innate immune system cells located in the tissues, but also in the central nervous system. And they help modulate acquired immunity as far as they, they recognize things and they remember them. So if they find a pathogen 
or a, a molecular pattern that they've encountered in the past that they've had to mount a defense to. They remember it and they get more efficient to mount that defense going forward. And they can rec the interesting thing is they can recognize molecular patterns associated with pathology. Um, and that can be different disease processes or different, you know, viral or bacterial um, things. They can recognize xenobiotics. So that's when we introduce foreign chemicals, uh, opioids, different, uh, you know, uh, uh, exogenous chemicals that aren't natural to the human body, uh, damps, which, and these are all associated molecular patterns, but damage. So that's the things that happen in our tissues and the common molecular patterns that occur in our tissues around tissue damage. Um, and then the interesting thing that they talk about are behavioral associated uh, molecular patterns. And if you read uh, Butler's and Mosley's Explain Pain Supercharge, they talk about the site of a snake or something, I believe, for somebody who's you know, fearful of a snake, it's going to mount these behavioral responses, but it also mounts these physiological responses of blood pressure, sweating, you know, heart rate and different things. Um, but it can, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is it also modulates skin conductance and other things. And that might be a little bit of a sympathetically mediated thing as well, but um, it's just this immune system and this pro-inflammatory state can be modulated by behaviors. And the other interesting thing, and that can also take into account the cognition associated molecular patterns, and that's kind of speculative. They don't, we don't really have hard data or hard research to show it. But again, when you think about fearful type things, and when we see that people who are the account bullying issues that they've experienced in their past, when their system goes into pro-inflammatory states, it would make sense that these TLRs and these receptors can possibly not only pick up the molecular patterns that we think about traditionally of damage pathology and exogenous chemicals, but also behaviors and cognitions, which is another way where we start tying in our thoughts and our beliefs and our behaviors to pain, um, where we cordon those things off as two different things. I think we're starting to see physiology and our understanding of neuroscience and neuroimmunology and all these neuroimmunoendocrinology and all these different uh, things combining that we're starting to see that there's physiology that we can start explaining that when people have different cognitions and stress that are related to stressful situations or traumas of their past, it can release and uh, different molecular patterns that our body and tissues respond to and, and mount inflammatory defenses. Uh, Mosley and Butler will talk about the immune set point as far as the, the level of sensitivity or immune system, and it can raise or lower depending on the state of the organism. And then we see these conditions such as fibromyalgia and others where there's this chronic pro-inflammatory, they do studies on these people and they see high levels of cytokines in their in their body when they do blood samples and salivary samples that we're starting to put the pieces together of these folks, not saying that it's all cognitive related stuff and different things, but there's a lot to be said of a, a dysfunctional immune system as part of this neuroimmune endocrine and all other systems combined that we got to start looking more big picture with these people and not just think um, that we're going to identify one system, treat it with one specific chemical, and all is going to be well. I think we've pretty well proven that that is not going to be the way that we're going to help people. Uh, otherwise, we would help a lot more people by now. The endocrine system, when we look at it from a peripheral effects, there's the sympathetic adrenal medullary where we start seeing the autonomic system in the form of the sympathetic systems release adrenaline and noradrenaline for you folks over in uh, the non... I, I, this drives me nuts when we have two different terms based on the U.S. and other countries, and I, I wish the U.S. would just get on board and get on with everything. I'm sure there's maybe some scientific jibber-jabber that makes people stick with this different terminology, but any adrenaline, noradrenaline, or in the U.S., epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, and these chemicals can really, you know, as part of the sympathetic nervous system, sensitize thing and put us into that fight-or-flight mode. Um, and then there's the APA, HPA axis, which is the hypothalamus pituitary axis, which is more slow-acting because it takes you know, the adrenals and the kidneys being stimulated with specific uh, hormones that cause cortisol to be released in the tissues. And you get this slow response where blood, as it gains access to the tissue, it modulates that inflammatory response. Ideally, it's a night, you know, it doesn't overshoot or undershoot and that it doesn't shoot constantly to where it gets tapped out. Um, but that's where humans being as unique as we are, we carry stress chronically. And that goes into Robert Sapolsky's work in the inverted U and why zebras don't get ulcers as far as how human beings carry so much stress chronically that we these glucocorticoids in the form of cortisol for us um, can get trucked out and have good good effects in the acute stage and in a short dose, but in a big, long, prolonged dose, really not good. Metabolically, vascularly, a lot of bad things can happen in the human being.
when stress is present chronically. And I give credit to Roderick or Rod uh, Henderson for this one. He uh, introduced me to this study by Patrizzi et al. in 2013, and it really looked at muscle as an endocrine organ. So muscle, and this kind of makes sense with how good we can all feel after a good run or a good workout where, you know, our memory and our cognitive function and our mood, we're like more cheery and different things, at least most of us are, uh, improved gene expression. This BDNF is an interesting chemical and Joe uh, Nyes really has talked a lot about it and has a whole article, I believe, just strictly on this as far as, um, you know, how it can relate to rehab settings and rehab science. But cytokine interleukin-6, there's some of these cytokines that can be more anti-inflammatory, so I don't want you to think that there's signals that can relate in different cytokines and interleukins and different things can have different roles. And it's, and the interesting thing is these roles can change depending on the context and the chemical environment that they're in that I will, again, that's going to start making your brain start smoking and, and getting uh, overwhelmed. But regardless, muscle can do some cool things as far as secrete endocrine factors into our body and really help immune system function, cognitive function, mood, memory, and all these different things. But it, that doesn't probably surprise too many of us when we think about how we feel and function after exercise. The autonomic system, when we go back to that Chapman article graphic that I showed you in the earlier slides, and we talk about, you know, the norepinephrine and epinephrine is kind of that from the autonomic system is just one of the electrical signaling systems that can help the immune system and nervous system and endocrine system kind of communicate with each other. But, it, you know, this norepinephrine, epinephrine, initiating arousal for fight or flight responses, it increases skin conductance. Um, in the presence of nerve injuries, we'll talk a little bit, I think here, we, there can be an insertion of, it should be of adrenal receptors that, and, or that respond to norepinephrine and epinephrine. So nerve injuries, but there's also talk of when the sympathetic system and stress chemicals get really uh, active around the periphery, these even peripheral nociceptive issues can become sensitive to sympathetic issues. And there's been discussions in different studies of, you know, injuries around high degrees of stress. So like a whiplash injury or, you know, a trauma or maybe a veteran who's gone through a hell of an experience where they've had a painful experience from a massive trauma and a massive stressor, or these patients who we see develop pain issues after the death of a loved one. I've had numerous patients where uh, you know, as part of their grief and stress and emotional reaction, they developed um, different conditions that appeared to have some sympathetically maintained components to them. Um, when we see that sweating and um, different things can go on. The other thing that's interesting, having read it in the literature, I don't have the specific citation for you guys tonight as far as anxiety and some of these comorbid issues that show that we, you know, those folks that have more of a I guess a system that might run more towards, you know, a fight or flight or, or more you know, on that continuum towards that, that they can have more of these sympathetic responses. And somebody just, I think it was uh, Lenny, oh no, Macrina, I don't know if I, I'm sorry if I butchered your name, Lenny, but uh, he just posted something about post-ACL surgery, this patient who had a significant asymmetrical sweating response and different things in the leg, in the surgical leg. And I think, you know, it depends on, it would be interesting to me to see if we look at patients, if around their injury, if it was a huge stressor for them or a huge issue uh, for them that they, uh, you know, that's brought a lot of stress and fear and anxiety that it can cause a sympathetic, you know, component to their pain situation. It sure makes sense to me. Um, and especially if we look at other literature around stress and, and injury, it, it, it would make sense that the sympathetic system can, can play a role and see some symptoms that sure look sympathetically mediated when we see some of our everyday post-operative patients. And I, I mean, we've probably all seen those patients who have some interesting sweating responses and different things to um, their, their pain situation. And I'm gonna close on this slide. And we have to recognize that today I talked about the periphery. So I talked about how the immune system, the endocrine system, um, the nervous system, nociceptors, and all these things are kind of present um, and can influence the periphery. Uh, the immune system is very present in, to, in the periphery um, with cells that are in our tissues. The endocrine system can electrochemically influence those tissues through uh, electrical uh, communication through our sympathetics and uh, parasympathetics. They can also communicate via bloodstream and truck in glucocorticoids and other uh, hormones that they produce depending on where they're coming from in the body. Um, but it's a massively complex system. So we're just getting you a piece of it. And the body doesn't cordon itself off into the peripheral uh, 
the central nervous system, the spinal cord and the brain, it's all one system. And again, I would all argue that it's all one system that's incorporated with the endocrine system and the immune system as well. I think we have to stop looking at these systems as three separate things and even other systems. It's, they all kind of work in concert. The human experience is one, all these systems working in concert for survival and reproduction. Um, that again, when we look at it from an evolutionary perspective. So info, input from the periphery is vital con to constructing our central nervous system awareness of our body and our parapersonal space. We'll talk about in our next lecture when we get into the spinal cord and the central nervous system, some of the interesting things that we see um, in CRPS patients and how our body can also have protection of space, not just our own body parts and how they're mapped in our brain, but we have almost a peripersonal space that's external to our body tissues that when certain our body enters that space, different protective mechanisms can occur, but, and it's pretty, pretty freaky what our body does. Um, and we're just kind of scraping the surface of understanding it better. So what happens to that input can vary due to so many factors in the spinal cord brain and in the unique human experience or where the input's happening. So I think too often in, in healthcare, we've really tried to isolate through x-ray, MRI, these specific tissue assessments from a manual therapist or these specific, uh, you know, flexibility assessments or movement impairments or, uh, you know, different things that are very much looked at from the periphery. I'm not saying they're all bad or anything like that. They can all have their place, but I think we can start explaining them a lot more broadly and take into account a lot of what happens um, from a systems perspective to better help the human who's experiencing because a lot of times these people have so many other things and comorbid issues. When we see these folks who have irritable bowel syndrome, trigeminal neuralgia, uh, migraines, and other things on their medical history chart, this should be cluing us into, man, there's some homeostatic system dysfunction stuff that's shown me on their medical history. I wonder if it's contributing or having a role on their current situation. And then we structure our history and how we may, you know, talk about things and making sure they got adaptive beliefs and behaviors around their pain, because all those things influence immune system behavior. It influences endocrine system behavior. We only care traditionally as physiotherapists based on neurologic sensitivity that we think we're going to just, you know, can quantify with a zero to 10 pain scale. I do a technique, I manipulate somebody's neck and give me your number now and think that it was all because of the tissue. And there's so much more to it than that. So next time we'll talk, we're going to talk about the spinal cord and brain and their role in the experience of pain. We'll get into probably some placebo and placebo mechanisms and different things and talk about how we have to be considering these responses when it comes down to a response of changed pain with our intervention to that patient, whether it be a massage therapy intervention, whether it be a manual therapy intervention, whether it be a, a peripherally uh, aimed flexibility exercise or, or strengthening exercise. Let's start looking more broadly. And I think there's ways we can do this without getting too complex so we can better help the human being in pain. So with that said, I just wanted to thank you all so much for joining me tonight. If you have any questions, put them on the thread below. And I'll definitely chime in. I will throw a ref reference list there if you would like as well. So you guys can check that out as, and kind of check any of the references you'd like to look at. Um, but uh, hopefully this sheds some light on the peripheral nervous, not even peripheral nervous, the periphery and its role in the pain experience. Next time we uh, chat, it'll be getting further into the spinal cord and brain. And then we'll get into the whole systems of the endocrine and immune system and all this stuff. Hopefully all pieces together and we'll better understand that person in pain and ideally we'll better help that person who's experiencing pain and, and struggling. So you guys have a great rest of your day and I will see you guys online.